All right, good morning. It is August 17th, 8.27 a.m. I had an interesting encounter with a hawk this morning. Um, There's one in my backyard trying to get a squirrel. I didn't get the squirrel. And he was just kind of standing in the backyard, and then uh, he's been... uh, he or she, I don't know if it's a male or female hawk, but it's been, you know, doing hawk sounds all this morning, which has been interesting. Why am I telling you that? I don't know. This is kind of filling in on the happenings around these parts, and that's what's happening. Um, all right. We are getting into chapter three of John today. Um, Jesus is finally on the scene, and... Um, we get to hear uh, from him today, and he's going to quote <clears throat> probably the most famous verse in the Bible, say one that everyone pro- probably has heard of. I have my children trying to break into the studio at the moment. Um, before we get into that, couple things. Uh, tonight at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, I have my uh, a free webinar that I'm giving on songwriting and music production. If you haven't signed up and want to, go to my website, jeffreyjocelyn.earth backslash webinar. I'll put a link in the description and sign up. And then, uh, yeah, have a good old time. Also, September 1st, new song. Blue Skies is coming out. You can pre-save that. I'll also put that link in the description. I think that's about it. Um, I'm going to pray and then we'll get into it. Father, we praise your name. We give you honor and glory for this day. Thank you for what you're doing this day. Thank you for the new thing you're doing in our lives and in our world. We just trust you in the midst of all kinds of craziness. Just thank you that you are at work in our midst, and we just ask that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear from you through your word today. Give us revelation, Father. Help us to see your word and and, and see you in a way that maybe we haven't seen you before. We give you praise and we bless your name in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now, there was a certain man among the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler member of the Sanhedrin among the Jews, who came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, teacher, we know without any doubt that you have come from God as a teacher. For no one can do these signs, these wonders, these attesting miracles that you do, unless God is with him. So uh, Nicodemus, he is a Pharisee, meaning he would be one of the higher-ups uh, in Israel, he would be someone who um, would know the scriptures very well. He would be one that would be teaching and um, be widely respected. Somebody very high up that should know about spiritual things. Should know scriptures and would be leading and instructing people. Now, we see that he came to Jesus at night uh, because it seems to be that he's curious and, you know, these guys are kind of leery of him during the day, but we see him kind of come uh, sneaking at night. Um, and then he says, you know, we know, we know that you've come from God as a teacher. So he doesn't acknowledge that Jesus is anything more than I mean, he's curious, but he doesn't acknowledge Jesus as anything more than a teacher. There's a lot of people that will acknowledge Jesus as a teacher. You know, a good, a good, a good teacher, a good guy, somebody we can learn from, but they won't necessarily acknowledge him as the Son of God, as God, as the Savior, as the things that um, he is, um, and are the ways you have to come to him if you want salvation. You know, there's a lot of teachers in the world, but Jesus didn't claim to be a teacher. He claimed to be the one, the way, the truth, the life, the one you have to come through 
to see and know God and have salvation. So he's coming to him. Um, he's curious, but he, he doesn't have eyes to see. And we'll see further that Jesus is, is trying to pull him into a greater understanding. Um, he says, for no one can do these signs uh, that you do unless God is with him. So he's coming to him based off of what he's seeing him do. He's like, oh, all right, you were obviously able to do some cool tricks. Um, you must have come from God as a teacher because you're doing cool tricks and only people that have God can do those cool tricks. And Jesus says to him, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, unless a person is born again, he cannot see and experience the kingdom of God. And the Amplified adds, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, sanctified. So Jesus gets right to the heart of the matter. It's like, Jesus, I know you're a good teacher and you're doing these cool things, so you must be from God. You know, he's kind of curious about what's going on here. And Jesus says, well, unless you're born again, you can't see or experience the kingdom of God. So now he starts talking about this other kingdom. You know, there are kingdoms of this earth and there's kingdom of kingdoms of God. And there are things about the kingdoms of God that are that transcend the things of this world. There are higher ways of being, different ways of understanding, um, ways of going and living and being that pertain to the kingdom of God. And you, you're not going to understand them unless you're born again. Uh, and that is to be reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, sanctified. And Nicodemus says, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter his mother's womb a second time and be born, can he? So he doesn't get it. He's like, I don't understand. You're saying I have to go back in my mother's womb. Um... And Jesus says, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And the Amplified adds, ever, he cannot ever enter the kingdom of God. Unless one is born of water and the spirit. Um, so, you know, when he says born of water, um, he could be talking about, you know, being born first time he could be talking about baptism, but he's adding, and the Spirit. You have to be born of the Spirit. And he's going to talk about the Spirit more and what that, what that looks like. He says, um, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. The physical is merely physical. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So the flesh, the things of this world, are going to be, you know, a certain way. And the things of the Spirit are going to be a, a different way. And you can't understand the things of the Spirit based off of the things of this world. You can't judge the things of the Spirit based off your understanding of the things of this world. They're two different things. He says, Do not be surprised that I have told you you must be born again, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, sanctified. And then here he's going to talk about the Spirit. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it's coming from and where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So he starts to make this comparison with the wind. It blows where it wishes. It, it, it goes and moves, and um, you know you see and hear its sound, but you don't know where it's coming from, and you don't know where it's going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. <clears> then <throat> Nicodemus says to him, How can these things be possible? Jesus replied, You are the great and well-known teacher of Israel, and yet you do not know nor understand these things from Scripture. <clears throat> now, I know you've probably met some people in, in your life that are so smart, it's like sometimes people are too smart. They know so many things that they have a hard time comprehending simple things 
or common sense things. Um, some people are so educated that they have that they can't grasp. You know, it's like they're overthinking things that shouldn't be overthought. And here's a guy who is <clears throat> he would he would be someone that would be to have great understanding of scripture. And here is, first of all, the guy that scripture talks about, the Messiah sitting right in front of him, talking to him about spiritual things, and it's he's not able to wrap his mind around it. He's not able to get what Jesus is saying. And Jesus is like, you're supposed to be the guy that has mastered these things and you don't understand. How can you be someone that's teaching people and you have no one, you know, you, you don't get it? How can you be so well read and not understand these things? You know, you can read every book under the sun, including the Bible, and not know God and not know things of the Spirit. This apparently is what Jesus is saying. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, we can we speak only of what we absolutely know and testify about what we have actually seen as eyewitnesses. And still you reject our evidence and do not accept our testimony. Now, he starts to use, uh, you know, uh, the word we and our. Uh, I'm assuming that he's now talking about himself and the Father or, or um, himself and the Holy Spirit or seems to be now bringing the uh, the whole gang into it. You know, we we speak only of what we know and testify about, we, about what we have seen. Um, and still you don't talk, you know, like essentially we, you know, me and the Father and the Holy Spirit, we come from above and we're trying to tell you about these things, but you don't listen. He says, if I told you, earthly things, that is, things that happen right here on earth, and you do not believe, how will you believe and trust me if I tell you heavenly things? So, <clears throat> if, I'm talk to you, if I'm talking to you about these, you know, these are basic things, if I'm talking to you about earthly truths and earthly matters, and you don't get it, how am I supposed to talk to you about heavenly things? You know, how can I teach you about the things that you, you know, you can't see if you have a hard time understanding and believing what I'm telling you about things you do see, no one has gone up to heaven. No one has gone up into heaven, but there is one who came down from heaven, the Son of Man Himself, whose home is in heaven. Just as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the desert on a pole, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, there's a story in the Old Testament. And, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to read it. Let's see here. Um, and the Lord said to Moses, this is in Numbers 21, make a snake image and mount it on a pole. When anyone who is bitten looks at it, he will recover. So Moses made a bronze snake and mounted it on a pole. Whenever someone was bitten and he looked at the bronze snake, he recovered. So Jesus is uh, pointing to this time in the Old Testament. And when everyone would look upon this thing, they would be healed. So Jesus is identifying himself with <clears throat> this uh, occurrence. He says, just as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the desert on a pole, so must the, so must the Son of Man be lifted up on the cross. And we'll see that later, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life after the physical death and will actually live forever. So Jesus is pointing to himself in this spiritual reality that he's going to be lifted up and by believing on him, just like in this story, which was a foreshadowing to Jesus, that they'll be healed. If they just put their eyes on him, they'll be healed. And he's saying they'll live forever, they'll have eternal life. Um, and that is life that is full and abundant 
uh, not only, you know, something that happens after you die, but it's life in the here and now, life that is full of healing, fullness, abundance, um, free from sickness, free from um, sin, free from, you know, being in captivity, in bondage, all these sorts of things. He's saying if you, just like, he would have, you know, he would have known, he would have known this story. And he's, he's pointing out, you know, like, look, here I, here's another way that you've seen me and who I am in scripture. And then here comes kind of the money verse, which everybody would know. And he's going to break it down for him. So, for God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave his one and only begotten son so that who, whoever believes and trusts in him as Savior shall not perish but have, ever, have eternal life. There's the gospel. God's love for us and all he created is so great I love this, it's dearly prized, you know. We are his dearly prized possession. He doesn't want us to perish. He doesn't want us to die. He doesn't want us to stay in darkness. And so he came as Jesus to die, to be the great and one um, eternal, you know, uh, sacrifice, the one sacrifice that trumps it all so that we wouldn't have to perish but we could live forever and have that forever eternal life now as well and he goes further for god did not send the son into the world to judge and condemn the world that is to initiate the final judgment of the world but that the world might be saved through him whoever believes and has decided to trust in him as personal savior and lord is not judged for this one there is no judgment no rejection no condemnation But the one who does not believe and has decided to reject him as personal Savior and Lord is judged already. That the one, that one, has been convicted and sentenced because he has not believed and trusted in the name of the one and only begotten Son. I mean, it doesn't get more clear than that. If you believe in Jesus and who he is and, and what he's here to do, If you put your faith in him, you receive eternal life. But if you don't, you stand condemned. Um, You know, in a lot of my study recently, I've kind of started to understand maybe the dynamic of the spiritual realm and and some things that, you know, we hear these stories and how they work, but don't necessarily understand. And um, the more I've learned about that, the more I kind of understand this dynamic between God and man and and sin and Satan, you know, it seems to me that Satan is this, he's like a lawyer and there are these courtrooms of heaven and then the heavenly realms, you know, there are certain realities, if you will. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. So in God's nature and God's realm and the realm of the spirit, He's holy, he's righteous, he is uh, perfect, he is so full of light and, and goodness that he can't, he can't, you know, any sin, anything other than that is absolutely demolished in his presence. It can't come into his presence, it can't be around him, it can't, you know, he is so other that anything that is not light would be absolutely destroyed in his presence. So because of who we are and because of our sin um, that puts us in a position where we can't come into that space into relationship with the Lord um, without being destroyed without being condemned without being you know cast aside just by the nature of who he is and then the nature of, of what sin is and my understanding is Satan will use those sins in this courtroom against us you know and so you know he uses this terminology to judge and condemn uh 
the one who does not believe <clears throat> is judged. It says it's been convicted and sentenced. So that that sentence is to be separated from God because of the nature of who we are in sin. So when Jesus comes and he fulfills this <clears throat> this calling, you know, that was set up in the Old Testament for years and years, this sacrifice, so that you see this sacrifice being made, this sacrificial lamb, this spotless lamb being sacrificed in place with the sin of the people on it. Forgiveness of sin comes by the transferring of sin onto this innocent thing. It's sacrificed, it's bloodshed, and somehow in the nature of things, spiritual things, you know, there must be a payment. There has to be, you know, there's kind of this uh, tit for tat, you know, this kind of like you've committed, you have this amount of debt, it has to be paid or else it's uh, the universe is out of balance kind of thing. So here comes Jesus to pay that debt. And so in a courtroom setting where you would have Satan coming to bring a charge against you, this person owes this amount. This person has done this amount of sin in their life. They have to pay for it. Well, then the punishment without Jesus is death. The punishment without Jesus is separation. But Jesus comes and says, I'll pay, I'll pay it. I, I, am, I have, you know, we'll, we'll see later on that he's going to come. He's going to pay that price, that debt for everyone. Um. But it's kind of like what he's talking about here is like coming into the courtroom and saying, all right, Jeffrey, you have this amount of debt. How are you going to pay it? The idea of not believing in Jesus would be like me saying, I'm going to pay it myself. It's like, how are you going to, how are you going to pay for it? You know, and it, Nicodemus in Nicodemus's case, it would be like him trying to pay for it with his good works and knowledge of Scripture, and you know, there's no, you know, the Bible says there's none righteous, so there's no, there's nothing I can pay that would cover my debt. So I would, ha I would have to take the penalty for my debt. That would be like someone who decides not to believe in Jesus. It's like, okay, you're going to pay the penalty for your debt. Well, you can't pay for it. You can try, which is a fleeting effort which is like people trying to fulfill the law, or you can take the payment, the free payment of your debt by putting your faith in the value of what Jesus did. I believe that his payment is good for my debt, and the blood of Jesus is the trump card, if you will. God, It allows God to be just, and it allows this legal supernatural courtroom to have its you know satan then has to submit to that judgment jesus has paid the price for this person the sin is was put on christ at the cross christ's righteousness was put on this person and that's the judgment that's the you know the gavel comes down and that's the order you know so the, that's what Jesus is talking about here. Is that by accepting his payment, your debt is paid. Your fate is sealed. You, you have been hidden in Christ. His righteousness has been put on you. And without that, you stand in condemnation and being judged in your own sin and in your own efforts, which are not enough to save you. Verse 19, this is the judgment, that is, the cause for indictment, the test by which people are judged, the basis for the sentence. So he's setting up um, what I just kind of said, you know, this sin as a debt. Uh, but he's going to use light and dark to talk about it. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For every wrongdoer hates the light and does not come to the light, but shrinks from it for fear that his sinful, worthless 
activities will be exposed and condemned. But whoever practices truth and does what is right, morally, ethically, spiritually, comes it to light, so that his works may be plainly shown to be what they are, accomplished in God, divinely prompted, done with God's help, and dependence on him. So, in talking about this judgment and condemnation, Jesus says it's like this. Light is coming to the world. He is that light. That's him. He's talking about himself. But people wanted to uh, hide. They'd rather continue to do what they, they're doing. Uh, they'd rather continue in sin um, and hide away. Um, and, you know, he, he, he might be talking about Nicodemus here because, you know, this guy's coming to him in darkness. He's coming to him at night. He's kind of hiding, you know what I mean? Uh, people love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For every wrongdoer hates the light, doesn't come into the light. You know, people that want to continue in sin um, are going to hide and don't want their deeds to be exposed because then, they'd, you know, then they'd have to change. That the light would be shining on what they're doing, and it would have to change. They wouldn't be able to do those things anymore because the light would expose it. The light exposes and casts out darkness. But if you come to the light, then the light can transform your darkness. If you bring your darkness into the light, it can be brought to light, transformed, and redeemed. And it says, whoever practices truth comes to the light. So if you come to the light, if you come to Jesus, it will expose not only your darkness, but your goodness. It's going to shine on a light. It's going to shine a light on who you are. So if you come to the light, be ready to be exposed. But if you come to the light, also be ready to be redeemed and transformed, sanctified, and um, have his righteousness be put on you in exchange for your sin having been put on him. So it's like if you want to walk in light, you have to bring your darkness into the light. And this kind of closes out his conversation with this guy, which is interesting because he comes to Jesus at, at night, kind of hidden away. And he's walking in dark. He doesn't understand. But yet he's supposed to be somebody that has all the answers. And you can't come to Jesus having all the answers. You have to come to Jesus in humility. Um, because you have nothing to offer him. <laughs> Compared to what he has to offer you, you have nothing. I mean, and just in general, you have nothing to offer. I mean, besides yourself. Like, it's what he wants. Bring yourself. But as far as what you think you've done for him... You know, it pales in comparison to what he's done for you. So the best thing to do is come to Jesus to receive what he's, who he is and what he's done. And it's pretty simple here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Do you want to perish <laughs> or do you want to have eternal life? It's simple. You know, it's kind of like the people that don't turn to Jesus like it's just because they want to remain in darkness. It's just that simple. Like, do you want to stay in darkness? Do you want to perish? Or do you want to have eternal life? It's not complicated. You know, there it is. I don't know what else to say. If you haven't done that, if you haven't made that choice, like, I wouldn't wait any longer. You know, you don't know that you have tomorrow. You don't know that you have the rest of this day. And the last thing you want to do is cross over into a, a spiritual world and into a supernatural realm in which, you know, somebody has to pay for every sin that you've committed <clears throat> and you haven't allowed Jesus to pay for that. You don't want to pay for that, trust me. <laughs> Especially when somebody's already paid it for you and all you have to do is receive it. So the Lord now in the name of Jesus, anybody listening to this, 
that hasn't accepted you, Father, I just pray that you would move. They were, their eyes would be open, that the light would shine, <clears throat> that they would have understanding, that they would be prompted, and they would move towards you. They would ask to receive your free gift, and their life would be transformed. They would be changed, and they would begin a relationship with you, a journey with you, an adventure with you that would be the greatest decision they've ever made and the greatest uh, form of life and the greatest life they've ever lived in knowing you, walking with you, and, and receiving that. And I uh, just thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your goodness, for your kindness, and for your word. And I just uh, give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.